This video is sponsored by Squarespace. I've been using Squarespace to host the channel's official site and merchandise store for about two years now. The clean UI makes it easy to create and customize content, embed YouTube videos, social media posts, and add new items to our store. A simplified all-in-one platform means you never have to install, patch, or upgrade anything, and I can tell you firsthand their 24-7 customer support is better than most tech companies in the PC space. Don't tell them I said that. Squarespace has everything you need for your next domain, website, or online store. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com bitwit to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part two, the follow-up video to February's PC of the month, which is of course the lovely Silverbuild Mini, which as we found in part one, gave us some clearance issues, mainly because I did not look those clearance issues up before I started building, so it's my fault, I suck, and now I can no longer show my face in public. To give you a little recap, I was trying to fit in this GTX 1080 Ti EVGA for the Win 3 before realizing it was just too wide to fit at all. So I moved over to the GTX 1070 for the Win, also from EVGA, and that was also too wide to fit this case. So what I ended up having to do was bend out this metal tab here, which is one of the four corners that our glass side panel mounts onto in order to get this behemoth of a card in there. And even then it barely fit. The issue was that because the card was so damn wide or tall or high, however you want to call it, this dimension, the side panel still wouldn't fit on because of the interference with the power connectors. They were sticking out just too far out of this already wide card in order to get the glass securely mounted. So it was a fail. It totally didn't work. What I ended up doing was swapping this card out with the Zotac GTX 1080 Ti Mini and that managed to save the day. Not because it's necessarily a narrow card. In fact, it's only a few millimeters narrower than this one or this one. The reason the glass panel fits with this card is because the power connectors are now located towards the middle of the case with this shorter length GPU. Whereas before they were so close to this corner mount that it was impossible to thread that side panel screw. Now, admittingly, the glass is pushing up very firmly against these sleeved cables here, but it's not doing any real harm to the system outside the scope of aesthetic. So I'm perfectly fine with it. And that's exactly how I tested this system today was with all of the side panels properly fastened and secured. At the very least, you guys can learn from these types of mistakes that I make on a very regular basis. But apart from that, I'm gonna try to do a better job of checking all the clearance requirements and compatibility with parts for builds moving on, uh, moving forward from here on out, just because I do think that is important. And sometimes I just get in a rush and I overlook little things that end up turning into bigger problems. So I promise you guys, I'm gonna work on that. On that note, let's talk about this system. How is it performing? What kind of overclocks are we getting on it? Temperatures, acoustics, benchmarks, and all that stuff. Starting with the 8700K that we have in here, I did overclock that quite aggressively to five gigahertz at 1.35 volts, running rock solid stable, didn't crash once during my stress test or any of our benchmarks, so it is looking really good. Um, this thing is an absolute beast, six cores, 12 threads, and very high overclocking potential. It is currently the fastest CPU on the market if you're talking about gaming. So one thing you do have to be wary of when running this chip at such a high frequency is thermals. And sure enough, we're keeping temperatures to a minimum with the Corsair H100i here that's being paired with two of those Redux Noctua fans, which a lot of you guys were complaining about in part one. I even got these same complaints in the original Silver Build video that I posted a couple years ago. People were saying these fans are not designed for radiators. They're not designed with static pressure in mind. They're a terrible choice for any AIO or radiator, which, okay, maybe on a spec sheet, it doesn't say you should definitely pair this with a radiator, but the temperatures we're seeing here proves otherwise. We're getting anywhere from 60 to 70 degrees Celsius under a heavy load at 2560 by 1440 in Unigen Heaven 4.0. 60s and 70s, guys, at five gigahertz is really not bad at all. Of course, there are those occasional outlier spikes that we get into the higher double digits. I saw it go all the way up to 95 at one point, but it was literally just for a second. 99% of the time, this thing is running pretty cool, all things considered. So sometimes you gotta peel yourself away from the spec sheet and just test the damn thing yourself to realize it works perfectly fine in practice. Who knew? So far our system is looking real nice. We've got a solid overclock with decent thermals on the fastest gaming CPU on the market. These benchmarks are going to crush. Now the graphics card may not be quite as interesting to talk about because I didn't overclock it. The reason for that being is that we already have a very powerful GP102 chip being stuffed and crammed inside of a sub seven inch PCB and cooler when most 1080 Ti coolers look like this. They're massive. 
So all that horsepower on such a small cooler, I didn't want to push things. And it's already pretty quick enough as it is from what I remember when I first tested this card out several months ago. So as you might assume, it's getting pretty warm. In fact, we hit 85 degrees Celsius at our hottest with average temperatures hovering around 83, 84 degrees Celsius under load, which is around the same temperature that you would see on a Founders Edition 1080 Ti, maybe a touch warmer, but at the same time, this card is significantly quieter. So there's the trade-off. Speaking of acoustics, I was very impressed just how quiet this system runs under load. It's insane. The Noctua fans are doing their thing. These are probably better. I know for a fact that they're better than the stock Corsair fans that come with this cooler. Uh, and for the price, they definitely should be. But damn, this thing's quiet. Even these little 80 millimeters. I mean, the system's not on right now, but when it is, even these little 80 millimeters, they're pushing, they're moving air, man. And they're seriously quiet and they're moving I'm getting cold. But enough of my yammering, you guys want to see the benchmarks. I tested six games and one synthetic being Firestrike Ultra because this is an ultra worthy system. The games were tested at three resolutions, 1920 by 1080, 2560 by 1440, and 4K, of course. Um, I am using the latest drivers, latest wiggle drivers for NVIDIA. That is driver, don't know what the driver is. I'll put it right here. And I should also mention the memory is running at its rated 3000 megahertz speed. That is 16 gigs of the Corsair Dominator Platinum's DDR4. Uh, with that said, ladies and gentlemen, here are your benchmarks for the Silver Build Mini. Holy smokes, this thing is an animal. It's so fast. These frame rates that we're getting are just through the roof. Um, starting with 1080, let's go with 1920 by 1080 and we'll scale our way up from there. At 1080, we are seeing some phenomenal numbers well over the 100 FPS mark. In fact, if you had a system that was kitted out similar to this one, I would seriously consider investing in a 144 hertz monitor because this thing is capable of taking you to that level. It is that damn quick. At 1440p, obviously, it scales down a little bit. Uh, we are still seeing over 100 FPS on average in every title that we tested, with the exception of Ashes of the Singularity, because it's a stubborn son of a gun. But that being said, uh, pair this with a G-Sync display or something like that, and it is smooth sailing, whether you're doing 1920 by 1080 or 1440p. That also goes for ultra-wide resolutions. If it can run 2560 by 1440 pretty damn well that well, then ultra-wide is not going to be an issue. In fact, it's going to be a lot easier to run uh, an ultra-wide resolution than 4K, for example. And even at 4K, this thing is topping 60 FPS on average in every game, except PUBG, because that game is, of course, horribly optimized and also a stubborn son of a bitch. All things considered, this is a remarkable system. It's much quieter than I would expect it to be for how small and fast it is. And it is probably one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, mini ITX gaming PCs I've ever built. Uh, honestly, 1080 Ti with an 8700K overclock to the max, jeez, gosh. I rest my case. And it's this one. But that is all I have for you guys today. So thank you so much for tuning in. Let me know in the comments what you think of this system and its results. I think they're pretty impressive. Curious to hear your feedback as well. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to toss a like on it. It helps us a lot. And feel free to get subscribed to the channel if you haven't already and click the little notification bell. In fact, even if you, all of you who are subscribed who are smart, Click the bell next to the subscribe button on my channel page so you don't miss anything because people were complaining in the past few videos that our videos weren't popping up in their feeds and that's not good and YouTube, you suck. So uh, click the bell, click the damn bell. If you'd like to watch all of our videos a week early without advertisements, you can also follow us on Floatplane for three bucks a month. It's totally worth it. If you'd like to help support the channel in a more impactful way, I'll put a link for that in the description. Apart from that, guys, thank you so much for watching. Have a good one and I'll see y'all in the next video.